Hello and welcome to Cutline in the Community. I am Nicole Carpenter, the Programs and Collections Director at the Westport Museum for History and Culture, and the host of today's episode, where we will be exploring the true nature of the Underground Railroad and the abolitionist movement in Fairfield County and the state of Connecticut. I am joined by Nicholas Foster, the Associate Curator at the Wilton Historical Society in Wilton, Connecticut. For the Historical Society, he has curated exhibitions on a wide range of topics, including semi-pro baseball teams locally, historical fashion, early colonial life, women's suffrage, and Wilton's involvement in war. He also oversees the Society's archive, the Wilton History Room, which documents Wilton's history from pre-European contact through modern times. Ramin Ganeshram is both an award-winning journalist and food historian, who is currently the executive director of the Westport Museum for History and Culture, formerly the Westport Historical Society in Westport, Connecticut. Ramin's area of study is colonial era African American history, particularly focused on the food ways of enslaved African Americans and mixed race people. We are also joined by Joel Lang, who during his nearly 40 year career at the Hartford Current, frequently wrote stories with a historical perspective including a history on the current itself. In 2002, he was the lead writer on a project called Complicity that examined Connecticut's ties to slavery. And in 2005, he co-authored the book sequel, Complicity, exploring the North's role in perpetuating and profiting from slavery. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. To begin, I'd like to briefly uh, give our audience some context about the slave trade and the realities versus the myths in Connecticut. I wonder, Nick and Ramin, if you would each give us an idea of the number of people enslaved uh, in the state, as well as the reality of ownership of human beings in Connecticut. So let me preface this by saying that exact numbers are very difficult to provide for a number of reasons. The, the first being that uh, census taking then as now uh, can be an imperfect science uh, and depends very much on who is providing the information. The second thing is that uh, the way taxation of human property happened in Connecticut and elsewhere in this country, uh, enslaved people who were under a certain age often were not counted uh, because they were not being taxed in public records. Having said that, um, Connecticut had the most enslaved people of any New England state. And by the time of the Revolutionary War, uh, the census that had been taken just before the Revolutionary War, there were 6,500 counted enslaved people in the state of Connecticut, most of whom resided in Fairfield County. And we, uh, we find that bears out in Wilton, too, trying to find uh, even local records sometimes. Um, our earliest census is, census is 1790. Um, so finding traces of enslaved people before then, um, you have to rely on a few different sources, and they're not always um, complete. Um, frequently, we find, uh, as Ramin alluded to, tax records, um, probate records of when uh, someone would pass away and essentially bequest an enslaved person. Um, and a few other areas, simply, uh, you know, writings and other documents that might mention an enslaved person is really how we have been able to find, um, the, the enslaved people in, in Wilton and the surrounding area. Um, and even then we're, we're constantly doing more research to find more people. So, uh, to Ramin's point, it's, it's difficult to find, um, the exact number, but we do know that, uh, slavery was extremely prevalent in the state, um, and the colony and the state throughout the 18th and into the 19th century. You had asked about the nature of slavery. Sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to, um, answer that question a little bit. And that is, um, it was different from slavery in the South, but it wasn't any less cruel or, um, any, any less difficult for the enslaved. So in the South, you had a plantation system for the most part. Uh, that system uh, meant that fewer families owned many, many more people to do, for the most part, agricultural labor. Here in Connecticut and New England, what we're talking about is actually more individual families owning fewer people. So you might have um, 
a great example here in Westport is the majority of founding families in Westport owned at some point during the colonial and early federal period anywhere from one to two to, in some cases, 12 other human beings of African descent and indigenous descent. So this is one of the ways that it was different in Connecticut. Um, and in Connecticut, uh, enslaved people lived in the homestead generally with their enslavers, whereas in the South, you again, a plantation system that often had uh, barracks or rudimentary housing for enslaved people. Um, only those who worked in the house may have at times remained in the house with their enslavers in the South. So this is um, a little bit of just a, a, a sort of um, the tip of the iceberg on how it was different, but no less cruel. And I know that both in Wilton and in Westport, there's been research that's been ongoing about the enslaved and also free Black populations. Um, is there ind any indication of um, individuals or uh, the known people that are recorded? I know in Westport, there is um, a record book within the church. Um, and I'm wondering if there are individuals that are known in, in Wilton as well. We have a few. Um, generally, they are um, the records, as I mentioned, are during the census. Um, and we do occasionally get names. Sometimes we don't. Um, we also have surviving things such as bills of sale, um, where we have we know at least two different enslaved people who were we have a, a, a history of their transaction through a document that has survived. They have a name that we're able to track. There was another man actually who uh, went by the name of Caesar, who we actually have pretty good records on because he was actually able to read and write. He wrote his own will um, and was actually a the first and as far as I can tell, only um, enslaved member of the Wilton Congregational Church. Um, so he shows up in church records um, and actually uh, has a few written documents. He actually wrote notes in several books that he owned that sort of tells about his life. So we are able to track um, and, and sort of tell a fuller story about some of these people. Um, but again, sometimes it's passing references to just, you know, African boy, um, Negro man. It, it's the, because of the nature of slavery, where it is very transactional and treated as property, the name doesn't always come to the forefront. Um, so when we are able to find a name, it, we're, we're very fortunate to sort of be able to, to see more into this person's life. And Ramin, are there those individuals in Westport as well? Very much so. Um, as you mentioned, Greens Farms Congregational Church, uh, the church record uh, book uh, from the mid 18th century into almost the mid 19th century is a very useful record for us. Um, it allows us, because of the way that record book was constructed, uh, the owner of enslaved people were referenced, um, and those references. Um, for example, enslaved people would be listed as births, marriages, baptisms, and deaths. And often, even when, as Nick said, there may not be a name, the owner's name would be recorded. So that allows us to, in some cases, follow and trace the tract of an enslaved individual's life. Um, here in Westport, we were extremely fortunate to have very good records of, about um, a couple who uh, were separately owned by two families. Uh, ultimately, uh, one of the individuals, um, the wife, was purchased by the husband's family to live in um, that house and were eventually emancipated in 1799. Um, we were very lucky to find their five times you know, uh, great-grandson, who once they left Westport went to upstate New York and have an interaction with him. And he filled in the gaps of their life. And so sometimes we get lucky that way. It's, as Nick said, it's it's not always, and that's it's unfortunately not as much as we would like. Genealogical uh, research can be difficult for anyone. It sounds like uh, the realities of researching Black history, uh, especially family history, can be especially difficult because of the limited resources that are available um, in this period of time. 
Now, Joel, I want to switch over to you. Uh, of course, you co-authored the book Complicity, yes. uh, where you specifically focused on the economic incentives and impacts related to the northern states' participation in the slave trade. Uh, could you expand on the ways in which Connecticut and the rest of the North uh, benefited from the institution of slavery? I have quotes that I want to read to you here, but uh, there's sort of two errors. First, the colonial era, where many, much of Connecticut's agricultural produce in all of New England's was sent south not necessarily to southern plantations, but to the sugar plantations of the Caribbean. It was a major source of early wealth for New Englanders, and especially uh, not a, but including Connecticut with no exceptions. Uh, and then the second phase would have been uh, the dependence on the northern manufacturing of cotton from the south. And when I used to give talks about the book, and it may be out of place, but I want to acknowledge my two co-authors, Jennifer Frank and Ann Farrow. Uh, I would, one of my, what I thought was a stunning figure, this goes, switches suddenly um, to 1860, the beginning of the Civil War, to recognize how important slavery was to the economy. But according, I'm taking my glasses off, according to the 1860 census, the value of slaves in the United States was $3 billion. That is more than all the farm equipment, all the manufacturing, and all the railroads and livestock put together. So it was, you can just extrapolate from that to the extent of the entire U.S. economy. Uh, profited from uh, slavery. And think of all the textile mills that are, were built in Connecticut in the, uh, whatever it started, 1820s, 1830s, all, all the mill valleys in Connecticut were working with cotton, which mostly came from the South. That's a brief uh, summary. Oh, thank you, Joel. Um... Just thinking about Connecticut history, we have a, a very, very rich history of um, textile manufacturing, as you mentioned, and that's that's a huge impact, um, especially if, if you think about the, the coasts and all of the, the products that are being imported and exported. Um, uh, Westport especially has uh, this, this bustling trade along the Saugatuck River, and then later on with um, Wilton and some of the products that they're making, well, and then throughout uh, the rest of Connecticut. Let me just... Uh add some things. I prepared several short lectures for this uh, program, but, uh, you know, Ramin, I know, is familiar with the exports from Westport, which, of course, is on the on the sound. But the uh, other source I like to quote, and this is very uh, vivid, from Bernard Dalen, who I believe, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he's considered the dean of colonial historians who's at Harvard, uh, this adds or undercuts uh, so many conceptions about uh, how New England itself became profitable. And we, I guess in school, we learned about, uh, you know, New England didn't have mo enough money to send back to the mother country. So Balin writes this, how was it that this unpromising, barely fertile region, incapable of producing a staple crop for the European market, became an economic success by the eve of the American Revolution? The most important underlying fact in this whole story, the key dynamic, unlikely as it may seem, was slavery. New England was not a slave society. On the eve of the Revolution, blacks constituted less than 4% of the population in Massachusetts and Connecticut and many of them were free, but it was slavery nonetheless that made, commercial, made the commercial economy of 18th century New England possible. And then he says the greatest profits were from this were the West Indies trade, uh, 
the planters, which imported all livestock, uh, wood staves, flour, any any kind of uh, sort of natural resource or agricultural product you could think of. So right. that's from Bernard uh, Balin, and I like to pair that, which is you know that's a about a hundred year span from the revolutionary period to the Civil War, where one economy or the other was tied directly to slavery. Right, right. Um, Ramin, I wonder if you would speak to some of the, the specific ways that Westport and Fairfield County benefited from this, um, this economy built on slave labor. As Joel and, and you have pointed out, the, the main way was in sending farm goods, um, specifically food, at first to the Caribbean. And Westport and, uh, of course, a fair amount of Fair Fairfield County being on the Long Island Sound, uh, Westport very specifically having a river that led from the Sound right into the heart of the town, uh, really created an ideal circumstance to trade with and ship material to the West Indies initially. So what would happen here, for example, um, grains, uh, cracked corn, wheat. Uh, we have ships manifests that talk about eggs, right? A lot of people don't realize that eggs can actually uh, remain viable for three to four weeks unrefrigerated. In fact, America is the only country that refrigerates eggs to this day. Um, and because of that, we would send eggs in barrels down to the West Indies, a trip that roughly took three to four weeks, salted meats. Um, and most of this was to feed enslaved people working in sugar plantations in the Caribbean. So sugar was the most important crop to the empire, for uh, the British empire for a very long period of time. So supplying food and resources for those who were tasked with growing, harvesting, and then uh, cooking down the sugar cane into molasses, uh, providing the foodstuffs for them, providing the clothing, the cloth to be made into clothing for them um, was an ongoing um, and continuous need that areas like Westport uh, were able and Fairfield County farm areas were able to, to fulfill um, and quickly get down to the West Indies, uh, basically on using ships, sloops that would come up the river here in Westport, and then go down to New York City to go on much bigger ships to go down to the West Indies. Now, Nicholas, is this the case in Wilton as well, knowing that this is uh, a community that is a bit more landlocked? Um, how, was, how was that community um, benefiting from this economy that we've discussed? Well, Wilton was, from its very early days, a an agricultural center. Um, and actually, wheat was one of the bigger products that that Wilton um, uh, grew. If you can, if you've ever been to Wilton, it's hard to believe. But um, the Norwalk River runs, and the Norwalk River Valley runs right through the heart of Wilton. Um, and there are many areas. There's actually one area of Wilton referred to as Egypt because the uh, the the wheat grew so strong and and so tall there that it was, you know, a great grain producer. Um, we haven't been able to track sort of those direct payments of sort of wheat, um, you know, leaving Wilton and heading down to the West Indies or being turned into other foodstuffs. But given what we know about how the Fairfield County um, economy operated, um, I wouldn't doubt that there was um, food being produced in Wilton that ended up, you know, in Norwalk Harbor, in Fairfield, in New Haven, in various other areas um, that did go, that did get shipped to the Caribbean. Um, it would be hard to believe that some foodstuffs in Wilton weren't, you know, a, grew here and then sold um, to traders going to the West Indies. I'd, I'd find it hard to believe. Um, and of course, the a lot of the agricultural work that was being done in Wilton um, was being done by enslaved people. As Ramin mentioned earlier, um, you supplemental um, labor through for free labor through enslaved people. Um, and some of these larger farms that we find in Wilton you know, have three or four, um, you know, adult males who are working in the fields. Um, so it's sort of this vicious circle of um, slaves producing food here um, that is then sent down to the West Indies to feed more enslaved people. Now, understanding that the United States, uh, the northern part of the United States is just as complicit in the slave trade as the southern states, 
Uh, what were the differences between the two halves of the country and the ways that enslaved people were living in these regions? We did discuss this briefly um, a bit earlier. I wonder if, Ramin, maybe you could expand on, on what these living conditions were like in the North. So as I said, here in the North, um, with the exception of a few, and there are some um, uh, houses, plantations um, that did have separate quarters for the enslaved. You can see this at um, the Royal House in Boston has an extant standing quarters of the enslaved. Uh, that was unusual. Uh, for the most part, we didn't have vast plantation systems. There were a couple in Connecticut and New London, but it wasn't the norm. So what I often tell people is that as you drive around Connecticut, you drive around Fairfield County, and you see some still standing beautiful homes from the 18th century uh, or the you know early to mid 19th century, if that was a family that had a big enough farm to require enslaved people, the enslaved people lived right in that house with those who enslaved them. They did not have their own rooms. You have to understand in this period of time in the 18th century, privacy as we knew it, as we know it today was not a concept for anybody, um, white, black, or otherwise. And certainly not for servants of any kind, whether free or enslaved. So that meant if you were an enslaved person and you were owned by a family here in Connecticut and you lived in the house as you would, where did you sleep? Well, it kind of in many ways depended on your job, so to speak. If you worked in the kitchen, um, you slept in the kitchen by the hearth. Uh, because you had to keep the fire, the embers going um, so that early in the morning when they had to be stoked again, you had a spark to work with. Um, if there weren't many enslaved people in the house, everybody might sleep in that kitchen because it was um, warmer in the winter. If you functioned as a personal servant to somebody who owned you, you slept in the hallway outside of their room or possibly on the floor right beside their bed should they have a need that they wanted you to fulfill, bring me water, empty my chamber pot, so on, um, in, during the night. If you worked as a nursemaid um, and you took care of children, you would sleep on the floor in that child's room. Um, other enslaved people who would perhaps more likely to have had possibly their own quarters separately would be people with highly skilled traits, such as a blacksmith. Um, might and often would live above the blacksmith shop. A groomsman or someone who worked with the horses um, might sleep um, above the coach house or in the loft of the barn. Um, an apothecary, uh, someone who worked essentially as a pharmacist, if the family was wealth and wealthy enough that they had a separate room or a separate building to store herbs and so on, most often it was a room like a larder in the house they might remain there, although cooks often usually functioned as apothecaries. So it really was a case-by-case -case basis based upon the work you were doing and the need that you fulfilled for the family that enslaved you. Understanding the realities that you all have discussed with us uh, that existed for enslaved people in Connecticut and in the North, where did this myth that the state of Connecticut was an abolitionist state um, where did this kind of romanticized image of the state come from? If uh, Ramin, you'd like to start. So I think about this um, a lot. I have a couple of theories. I, I certainly would love to know what Joel thinks about it as well. But um, to my mind, one of the main things that created this myth was um, Uncle Tom's Cabin because Harriet Beecher Stowe lived in Connecticut. She was a great abolitionist from, a, from a, an abolitionist family. Her father was Henry Ward Beecher um, in New York. And she really, Uncle Tom's Cabin, was that first major national, international work that shed light on, exposed the horrors of slavery. So I feel that on some level, um, the fact that she was from Connecticut, she was, you know, she was a, a contemporary on some level and admired by um, people like Walt Whitman and so on, um, 
that created um, an illusion in the mind of many people that Connecticut was a pro-abolition state. Um, in later years, I really think that the Civil War had a lot to do with uh, furthering this myth, not just about Connecticut, but about the entire North um, in the mind of Americans at large, where it, it became very easy to paint the South as um, the, the complete aggressors in this situation. The war uh, was very clearly fought over slavery, um, as is human nature to create um, a villain and a hero uh, because slavery and its ill effects were so obvious in the North, in the South, um, it was easy for the North to kind of slip under the radar, if, if you will. Um, that's my thought on it. I would love to know what Joel yeah. Joel's opinion is. Well, thank you. Uh, I had, uh, I think you pretty much covered it. I had forgotten about, uh, wasn't thinking of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, what I was thinking of was the Civil War and an essay I read at the time of doing this research by War Robert Penn Warren. Uh, and it was written on the, uh, I think, the 100th anniversary of the Civil War. But he wrote about the uh, the great alibi, which he applied to the South rewriting of what the Civil War was about. And the term he applied to the North was treasury of virtue. So I certainly think the two things that remain mentioned contributed to that treasury of virtue. And I'm not adding much, but if you you back up just a second, you know, to the extent anybody learns about the Civil War anymore, it is that the North fought the war to end slavery. And um, so it's this blanket uh, apology, uh, excuse, uh, uh, get, out of jail, jail, get out of jail free pass for the North uh, profiting from uh, slavery. And uh, I just, it may seem unfair. I want to go back. Uh, Nicole used the word term slave trade, which is easily mixed up with the slave economy. And I would like uh, Ramin to help me out on this. So often, even now, when people talk about slavery, the horrors that were inflicted, they think of it as a moral issue. They think of it as the, how slaves were treated and how cruel, cruel slavery was to those people. The term that's more often, a term that's more often used now and recognized by scholars is the Atlantic economy. The point about this prof, these, this whole history is the economic benefits that the North realized from slavery. So that uh, whether or not it was an abolition, more or less an abolitionist state, you've got to remember to think of slavery as an economic force that affected the whole Atlantic world and not as a question of human morality and evil, which it certainly was, but you, you get stuck on, I think that's part of the Civil War, you get stuck on the treatment of the slaves and the cruelty of slavery and uh, forget about the economic consequences. So I'm going back to one more thing. Part of the Civil War myth about the American myth is, well, it was the industrial North and the agricultural South. And after uh, Civil War, the South was impoverished. So from the same 1860 census, the, high, the states with the highest uh, white per capita income in the U.S. were South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Georgia. The, the South was the, by population, not counting the enslaved people, was the richest area of the country. And it's uh, sort of a modern... Uh, Connecticut now it used to be known for having the highest uh, per capita income. In 1860, Connecticut was the first New England state ranked after those uh, southern states in terms of wealth. 
That's another way of demonstrating the economic impact of slavery. I know we talked about this. Maybe she would like to say something about the Atlantic economy and how what how that thinking goes now. Joel is completely right. The scholars who who study slavery uh, here in, in in on this side of the world, and we're talking about North America and the Caribbean, uh, we're, we talk about the Atlantic economy. And um, so there's a couple of things that um, Joel brought up that I really think are important and that we need to think about when we talk about this. Um, the first is there's slavery, the condition of being enslaved, which can be and often was multi-generational. Um, and so this is, you know, one, an enslaved person who has children, who has grandchildren, um, all born into slavery. Um, the trade could refer to a number of things. First, that kind of the, the beginning of enslaving people in Africa and selling them um, as relates to Connecticut, most likely into the West Indies. Most enslaved people in Connecticut and in the North came via the West Indies. They did not come directly from Africa. There are some cases when that happened, usually in New London, in Newport, uh, because you're talking about ports that were frankly big enough to accommodate slave ships. But down here in Fairfield County, you're talking for the most part about people who originally came uh, from the West Indies, from the Caribbean. Other types of trading or the, the economy of slavery were sales between and among people already here in the state. So a family selling an enslaved person, or as Nick said, willing, you know, giving as a bequest an enslaved person to another family member, or, or just outrightly selling an enslaved person to another individual. And then there's the larger economy that, that we've been talking about and that Joel has, has been discussing. I want to make a point here about the wealth of the South, as Joel has said, in turn, and because of the economic engine of slavery, to have vast amounts of free or um, over time amortized and therefore very cheap labor uh, for these vast po uh, plantations. If we remember our revolutionary era history, the South was needed to fund the Revolutionary War. Therefore, the South had to be on board with the war. Even as early as the revolution, concessions were made to, to uh, continue the institution of slavery, the economic engine of slavery, that Atlantic economy that the South benefited from to get their support for the war. So when we think about it as an Atlantic economy, that's, to my mind, this is the correct way to think about it. Uh, because you're talking about an economy, an engine that essentially created the Western Hemisphere as we know it. To Ramin's point about that, that was the, the South's gamble during the Civil War as well. They were so important to the Atlantic economy that the British were going to join on their side. And even though the British had abolished slavery in the 18, uh, you know, genera a generation earlier, um, the South basically said the, the British Isles are so reliant on us for cotton and other materials through our slave economy. There's no way they're going to they're going to get involved and they might actually become allies with us. I mean, that tells you how important the South somewhat realized how important they were in the economy of, as Ramin and Joel said, the Atlantic economy, the entire almost Western economy um, was based around Southern slavery to some extent. These goods are so intertwined with uh, the economy throughout the world, and that clearly just shows how important and how vital this uh, the economy built around slavery was, uh, both during the 18th and later on into the mid-19th century, not only for the United States and Connecticut, but also uh, globally for that economy. Um, Getting back to uh, abolition and Connecticut and this this myth of um, kind of being this free state, even into the North, uh, very often we hear of spaces in homes in uh, Fairfield County and throughout Connecticut um, having these these hidden spaces or hidden spots within their homes 
that homeowners very often claim to be stops on the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is the case very much in Westport. And I wonder, Ramin, if you could elaborate a little bit on the situation in the county and Connecticut and what these structures might actually be. First of all, Connecticut, because of its complicity with this, with the Atlantic economy and it's, it's dependent upon it for its wealth, um, very vigorously and actively supported the fugitive slave laws, the federal fugitive slave laws that had been enacted in um, the 18th century, the first one being signed into law by George Washington. Um, these laws said that in a, a, a self, we call it self-emancipated, people will often say escaped, but a self-emancipated enslaved person um, who, le who you know, go to a free state are obligated by the federal law to be apprehended by agents in that state and returned to their owner. Some states didn't comply. Um, New Hampshire is a great example of a state that basically didn't comply. George Washington's uh, wife, Martha, lost uh, her maid, Ona Judge, who escaped, self-emancipated from the president's house in Philadelphia, made her way to New Hampshire, where uh, federal agents there, uh, or local agents, state agents, refused to comply with the federal agents and turn her over. Connecticut, on the other hand, absolutely fully complied with these laws. So that meant that enslaved people generally try to avoid the state of Connecticut, particularly towns on the water. Um, Self-emancipation by water was, was preferred. It was faster. Remember, the waterways were the highways uh, of the, you know, well into the 19th century. Um, it was safer. You could stay hidden. And you didn't have to go into the interior of the state that complied with fugitive slave laws. Um, so what are these rooms in people's houses that they say, I have a hidden room, I have a back staircase, I believe my house was on the Underground Railroad. Um, so we need to kind of look at uh, the period holistically to understand what these spaces are. When you're talking about a house that was built in the 18th century, uh, particularly around or just after the Revolutionary War, these rooms are likely safe houses, safe rooms. Um, and here's the reason why. During the Revolutionary War, you had, uh, it was chaos. It wasn't the myth that is told that all Americans were patriotic and they wanted freedom from England and everyone participated equally. In actual fact, it was chaos. In actual fact, only 30% of the country supported revolution, 30% were loyal, another 30% didn't care. Mixed in there, or third rather, 33%. Um, mixed in there were soldiers of fortune, people who uh, switched sides as needed in order to pillage and maraud and burn property and steal and worse. Um, so it was a very chaotic time. It was a very frightening time. And uh, people building houses, both during that time and soon thereafter, often built these rooms in which they could hide themselves and their family should another upheaval of this kind happen. Prior to that, rooms were often built to hide goods. You have to understand that in the colonial period, every single piece of property you own, down to a teaspoon, was taxed by the British crown. And one way to uh, lower your tax burden was to hide your goods. Um, so a lot of these little rooms and safe rooms um, were for that purpose. That's not to say there aren't underground railroad houses in Connecticut, there certainly are. Some towns, um, I've been looking a lot at the town of Colchester, which had uh, quite an abolitionist spirit, and I would not be surprised if there were underground railroad houses in Colchester. Nick can speak about one in Wilton. Um, they did exist, but not not in any stretch to the extent that people believe, um, and primarily because Connecticut uh, felt very strongly that it was in its best interest to help its southern neighbors to return self-emancipated enslaved people back to their owners. Given that Connecticut was compliant with the Fugitive Slave Laws and uh, the, excuse me, the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, it was not a friendly place for self-emancipating people. Uh, Nick, I do wonder if you would discuss a little bit about uh, Wilton's abolitionist movement and uh, one particular individual with William Wakeman and the known 
uh, Underground Railroad stop in Wilton. Yeah, so um, in Wilton, actually, the, the an area in Wilton called Georgetown, which actually sits sort of on the, the Wilton, Redding, um, Richfield border, um, there was a, a Baptist church community um, that became very vocal, um, a, a very vocal community for abolition. Um, they had several reverends who spoke out against slavery. Um, they did sort of see it as the humanitarian issue, the humanitarian issue that it was, um, and began to take steps to advocate for um, for abolition. Some more uh, drastically than others. Uh, one of the members of this community was Nicole, as you mentioned, William Wakeman. He was a farmer who lived on on Seely Road um, here in Wilton. His father was an abolitionist. He was an abolitionist, and he actually built a tunnel underneath his house to try to help self-emancipating enslaved people, or formerly enslaved people now with this self-emancipation, hide out from these authorities, these state agents, these federal agents who were looking for um, what they saw as fugitives. So essentially what this tunnel was, was a, a stone and brick tunnel underneath the house that went out um, to a sort of a, a, a brushy, woodsy area where if someone were to come knocking at the door looking for um, looking for a what they called a fugitive slave, that person could um, basically hide out in the woods until trouble had passed, until you know, William Wakeman could sort of uh, lead the authorities astray. Um, so this tunnel still exists, um, and we do we have photographic evidence that it did exist. So we know of at least one house um, that was on the Underground Railroad. Um, we and it was uh, very dangerous for these people to do it because, as as uh, Remy pointed out, this was against the law. Um, this was a a very serious crime if you were caught harboring self-emancipating people. Um, and there's actually one house that we've sort of recently rediscovered um, to be a stop on the Underground Railroad, not too far from the Wakeman's house, owned by the Chichester family, um, who uh, actually had their house um, bombed by uh, pro-slavery rioters, essentially, while one of these um, abolitionist committees was meeting um, at the house of Aaron and David Chichester. A gunpowder bomb actually went off and blew out several windows in the home. Um, it was actually not the first bombing that took place against one of these these abolitionist groups. So um, there has been some writing to suggest that their house was also on the Underground Railroad, and we're not sure um, if it's a house that's still standing or if one that's since been demolished. But um, we're doing a little bit more research into that. So we do know of at least two, um, at least one spot and possibly a second that was on the Underground Railroad in Wilton. But again, this was not the norm. It was a rarity because it was a, a rather dangerous thing to to undertake. I do want to say that um, there are uh, uh, other towns in Connecticut. I mentioned Colchester, for example. New Haven uh, was uh, a known stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, uh, a family of reverends by the name of Beeman, Amos Beeman, a uh, very well-known um, conductor on the railroad. Um, we know this from his writings. Um, but to Nick's point, um, about trying to reconstruct these things, um, it was a secret and lives were at stake. So it's very hard to reconstruct the evidence. Uh, Reverend Beeman left enough writings that um, we know that his church, a Baptist or an AME church in New Haven, was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Both you, Ramin, and Nick have have cited the difficulty in in researching these stops. How is it known that some of these underground roads, railroad stops even exist in Connecticut, um, given the unfriendly nature of the state? Are there specific sources or specific uh, documents that are looked at to try to determine the status of a stop? As I said, um, one of the reasons we know that the, the house in Wilton had a stop is because the tunnel still exists. There's physical evidence, um, but that is relatively rare. Um, that it would have been a lot of effort to build that tunnel. So it's not like, you know, people, when you say the Underground Railroad, it being literally underground is rare, is not actually the case. Um, it, this is a, a sort of a rare instance of physical evidence existing. Um, as far as other research goes, usually in writings that people might have kept, but you know, you don't want to record yourself committing a crime, whether or not you believe it's a important humanitarian, you know, effort or otherwise. Um, so it's not like we're going to have people writing in their diary. Today, I, you know, helped six self-emancipating people up to the north, uh, to Canada or, or somewhere else. Um, so it really comes down to 
rare occasional writings. We know about the Chichester House in Wilton through another Baptist reverend's journal, but he's writing in 1881, well after the Underground Railroad was no longer needed. Um, so it, it's a difficult thing to research. Uh, Ramin, what kind of sources have you found for the, the sites that you have um, discussed? The sources that are generally looked at, um, I, I want to make a point here first that the Underground Railroad um, predates the Underground Railroad, right? The term Underground Railroad, of course, is relating to the period of time when there were railways being built. This is in the 1840s. But prior to the existence of a railroad, there were abolitionist societies that helped people self-emancipate uh, from the South, usually by water. Um, and they provide often sometimes the best record that we have because a great example is the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. They kept minutes. Um, they talked about their efforts, moving people, you know, north from the south. Um, they pursued uh, redress under the law whenever they could. So legal cases um, that might relate to whether somebody, um, you know, should be, uh, uh, should continue in a state of bondage. Do they have legal redress to be self-emancipated? Um, and sometimes in the background and the writing uh, of these cases, we can glean little bits of information about uh, people who were involved in the abolition movement and moving people from safe house to safe house. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, it is writing, as Nick said, after the fact. Here in Westport, uh, we can assume, and a lot of it can be sort of um, its interpretation and assumption, uh, we have a park here in Westport called Winslow Park. Uh, it's named after the man who owned the property in the 1840s and 50s, Richard Henry Winslow, who was both a Connecticut state senator and also a congressional representative for the state of Connecticut. Um, while we don't have a lot of material talking about Winslow as an abolitionist, what we do have is a guest book from his house called Campo House. It was a fabulous mansion that once stood in the park. Um, for the 4th of July festivities. And one of the guests was a man called Elihu or Elihu Burritt, also known as the learned blacksmith. Very active abolitionist, not just in Connecticut, but throughout New England. The fact that we can place Burritt in this house in Westport, the home of a state senator, later congressional representative, um, it becomes a clue to us that Winslow was supportive, at least in some part, um, in abolition. The, it's these tiny threads that make us look at people twice. Could Winslow have been uh, a conductor on the railroad? I'm not saying he was, but it's that kind of logical flow that allows us to, to look at it um, and think about it um, in, in, in great detail. Nick talked about uh, uh, the Wakeman family and Wilton, being abolitionists and, and conductors on the railroad, the Wakeman family in Westport, for the most part, enslaved other people. Not every Wakeman, um, but many of them. So again, we use logic and say, what is the logic that any of those people who had enslaved people in their own home would be participating on the Underground Railroad? And it's highly unlikely. Uh, I wonder if each of you would share your belief and your understanding of the history of the Atlantic slave economy, um, abolition, and enslavement in Connecticut, uh, and how it can help the United States move forward. What can we take from this history in our state, and in the North and in the United States, uh, even understanding this trade globally? Um, how can we use this to, to move forward as a society? Well, I, I think it's extremely important to realize that it's not like the Civil War ended slavery and then we just went and moved on from there. Uh, I think it's extremely important to realize that, you know, for the vast majority of African American people in this in this country whose uh, ancestors were enslaved, you know, you start essentially start life in this country after emancipation with nothing um, in many cases, and and so many of these, you know older families in, in, in Connecticut and across the, the United States, um, a lot of the economy was built off the backs of these enslaved people. And a lot of this wealth is established. And then 
people are emancipated with without access to the wealth that they created. Um, and, you know, we see it down through the ages of you know, people still trying to get a foothold in this country after their ancestors were brought here involuntarily. And we need to understand the context for, you know, a, a lot of the, the issues that we look at today with, uh, you know, relationships between um, different races in this country and how uh, policing is done in this country and where wealth is accumulated in this country dates back to the Atlantic economy that was built um, throughout the 17th, 18th and into the 19th century. Um, and it's really sets the context for a lot of the things, a lot of the institutions in this country that we might not immediately link to slavery, but it's. Um, and understanding how those institutions operate, um, you need to understand how the Atlantic economy worked. Um, and it's not until you understand that economy that you can begin to understand why some of these institutions and laws and and um, you know relationships between people takes place. Um, and we can kind of question whether or not those institutions need to exist in the format that they do. Ramin, maybe if you'd like to expand on this idea of, of how we can move forward understanding this history. You know, uh, there's a couple of things I always tell people when, when we talk about this. The first is that um, for many people, very rightfully so, this is an extremely painful uh, or uh, difficult, embarrassing for some discussion. People feel uncomfortable feeling that maybe their ancestors were complicit in this system. Um, guilt, shame can often be part of the discussion. So what I say to people is the first thing we need to do to move forward is we need to look at things in terms of the numbers. Numbers don't lie. And as Joel has said, and as Nick has said, the, the wealth created, um, the money that was moved, uh, the generational and foundational leg up of a strong economy was based on vast numbers of enslaved people being brought to the Western Hemisphere uh, as the fuel for an economic engine uh, throughout the Atlantic region. And these are numbers, these are facts. Um, so let's look at it from there first so that we can then say, as Nick has said, and what has that meant to generations of people on both sides, the enslaved and the enslaver? Um, when we understand the disparity, then we can start to think about how to rectify the disparity. I would also say to move forward, it's incredibly important for us in states like Connecticut and throughout New England um, to really understand the truth. Connecticut was not an abolitionist state. It was not a shining star in the North. Uh, it did not fight on the side of right, even in the Civil War. I just want to give you this number. During the Civil War, 80% uh, of eligible African-American men who could enlist to fight in the Civil War on behalf of the Union, Union Army did so. By contrast, white Connecticut men did not want to enlist to the extent that towns were given authority by the state to issue uh, bonds or rewards for signing up. And so many men here in Connecticut, Benjamin Tokay, a name well known in Connecticut, in Westport, sorry, um, availed himself of this bond in order to sign up to fight for the union. He was not going to do so otherwise. We need to face this fact. We need to understand it because as long as we wrap ourselves in this cloak of uh, disbelief about the moral right of the state of Connecticut in this issue, we can never uh, really examine the complicity and address the multi-generational impacts of it. Joel, if you'd like to round out our discussion today. People, I'm talking very much in general, people will say, well, slavery always existed. It, it goes back centuries. Many societies had slavery. And then they will say, well, the United States atoned for slavery by fighting the Civil War at great loss of life. Even today, so far as I know, there has never been a formal apology, never mind reparations, an apology for slavery. When I looked it up, I think that the Senate it's in notes here someplace, at one point passed a resolution apologizing for slavery. And the House 
separately pass the resolution, but there's never been a national apology for slavery, a national acknowledgement that slavery existed and was bad. So the quote that I would end with, and I, in deference to James Baldwin, which I just happen to have, you know, from pages and pages of research, the Americans, and this is from uh, uh, an essay, American Dream and the American Negro, the, and it relates to what Nick said in Ramin. The American soil is full of the corpses of my ancestors through 400 years and at least three wars. Why is my freedom, my citizenship in question now? And this is the Senate's coming. What one begs the American people to do for all our sakes is simply to accept our history, in which the United States has not done. I think it's still impossible to accept that history, acknowledge that history of slavery. It still hasn't happened. That's my conclusion. I want to thank all of you for sharing your thoughts on this very difficult, uh, this very difficult topic. We do, of course, um, want to thank all of our panelists this evening. Uh, Nick, Ramin, and Joel, thank you so much for sharing your research and your insight into this very difficult topic and this important history. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. This has been a production of CPTV's Cutline in the Community with the Wilton Historical Society and the Westport Museum for History and Culture. To learn more about this topic and other regional history, we encourage you to visit virtualhistorywestport.org or wiltonhistorical.org. And we want to thank you all for joining us. Thank you. <laughs>